Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pod. Tonight, I will be your guide on a tranquil journey to a very special place in San Francisco. But before we go there, let's make sure we are comfortable, relaxed, and still. As I tell you about this place, Try to let go of all other thoughts that may be in your head or in your heart at this moment. I know it can be a challenge to lie still, but try not to think too hard about it. This next half hour or so is for your listening pleasure alone. So, we'll start by allowing our lungs to breathe deeply. Inhale as you feel your chest rising gently. Then exhale. And imagine any cares of the day leaving your body and exiting your mind. And when you're ready, we'll begin. Tonight, I am going to take you to San Francisco, but not to any of the active, exciting attractions. This time, we will visit a traveler's oasis, known for its serenity, tranquility, and harmony. It is better known as San Francisco's Japanese Tea Garden. You'll find this special place in the heart of San Francisco's Golden Gate Park. If you are looking for silence amidst the noise and throngs of tourists, an escape and treat for your senses, you will find it here. The Japanese tea gardens were built to exhibit intricate design and Japanese botanicals. The immense greenery calms all who enter. It is also the oldest continuously maintained Japanese public garden outside of Japan, attracting visitors since way back in 1894. So, if you are looking for a way to escape noisy urban life, let's go. Welcome to the Japanese Tea Garden. Our highlights begin at the entrance of the Japanese Tea Garden. Arriving at the front gate, we notice that the point of entry is a fascinating piece of architecture. We look up at the gate and see that it has been skillfully crafted without the use of any nails. We enter and continue strolling through the garden, wandering and weaving our way through so many colors. Endless flowers and trees but all planted with a certain design, as if crafted by a garden artist. And indeed, this alive garden is a monumental masterpiece. We arrive at the historic drum bridge, which many also call the Half Moon Bridge. Seeing its crescent shape, we marvel at how it is a visual representation of the connection humans can have with nature. Would you like to take a picture here? Stand very still, and I will capture this beautiful moment and memory for you. Now that we are in a reflective mood, we move over 
to the 9,000 pound bronze lantern of peace. It was brought here as a memorial gift to symbolize friendship between America and Japan at the end of World War II. We stand for a while without speaking, just gazing in wonder at this gift. We might recall the hardships those men had to face many years ago, and we hope for peace to settle in our own hearts the way it had finally for them. Another blissful spot is just a stroll that way towards some pretty palms. So we wander there towards a Buddha statue. Can you see it now? It is over 200 years old, was first cast in 1790, and gifted to the garden in 1949. Passing the statue, there are more koi ponds and waterfalls to see. Here, no one is rushed or hurried, except a couple of children who chase each other gleefully as they skip past us, laughing. The koi under the water seem to be laughing, too. They splash their colorful tails in your direction, and you bend down to examine them. The garden is reflected in the water's surface, and from your position, you also see yourself in silhouette form, backdropped by a clear sky. You wonder how the Japanese came to be, how such a quiet escape was built in such a bustling and busy city, and how it has been kept over the years so well. And so I tell you, back in 1894, California held a midwinter international exposition. It was on this site, originally just one acre, that a Japanese-style garden was built for the exposition. But the garden was so lovely that no one wanted to see it removed after the event. So, the city called on Makoto Hagiwara, a Japanese landscape architect. He was tasked with maintaining the property as a permanent garden. Over the years, this immense property grew, just as the love for the plants and flowers grew in Hagiwara's heart. In fact, the gardens became the gardener's life's passion. As the official caretaker, he lovingly planted, tended, and cared for the trees and plants, expanding this masterpiece until it encompassed nearly five acres. And now you know, it was born out of the passions of a man to tend and nurture the earth. And as the gardens grew, expanding beauty the amount of people who flocked to San Francisco to see them grew as well. As you wander, look up to the lifted branches of trees, some of which are more than 100 years old. Come with me to the Zen gardens. It is amazing, filled with rock sculptures. Open spaces here tighter pathways there, waterfalls in between. Everything has been planned, planted, and laid out mindfully. Even the way the open spaces contrast tighter corners of hedges, you notice this thoughtful design throughout. 
Another thing to look at closely is the cultural influences found everywhere in the garden. For example, the edges trimmed to resemble Mount Fiji in Japan, or the drum bridge as it appears floating over reflective waters below. Now that we have been walking a while, you feel thirsty, and you would like to partake in some Japanese snacks. Might I suggest we visit the tea house? It is open every day, and small, traditional Japanese snacks are served daily. If you have never tried Japanese treats before, let's start with kuzo mochi, a type of sweet rice cake. This light Japanese dessert is perfect for a relaxing day and mindful eating. It is made with starchy kuzuko powder, a natural and unprocessed powder extracted from the kuzu plant. In Japan and other Asian countries, it is often used as a thickening agent. To make kuzu mochi, the process is simple. The powder is dissolved in sweetened water. Then, the mixture is poured into molds and left to set. Its gelatin-like texture and mild flavor is perfect because it doesn't seem too heavy or too sweet. You may eat it chilled, and it is often dusted with roasted soybean powder and doused in brown sugary syrup. Or, perhaps you would like to try dorayaki. This is a type of pancake with red bean filling. For a healthier snack, let's savor some hot miso soup or traditional udon, a Japanese noodle dish. Finally, I want to offer you a sample of authentic Japanese teas. There is a green tea or matcha tea. Can you smell its wafting aroma? The pots of tea warm your hands, and as you sip their flavor, allow the fragrance and warmth to linger in your body, feeling it soothe and heal any tiredness you may feel. Breathe in the fresh taste of tea and breathe out any negative energy you may have been holding inside today. Afterward, I invite you to stroll some more, looking at keepsakes at the gift shop. There are intricately painted, glazed ceramic sets, traditional Japanese dolls with their kimonos and native costumes, and collectibles that you may want to keep as memories of this beautiful day. Remember, the Japanese tea garden is open all year long, even on holidays. You will find it located at 75 Hagiwara Tea Garden Drive, near the California Academy of Sciences, the De Young Museum, and the San Francisco Botanical Gardens. If you are thinking of coming here again, the most gorgeous times of the year to take in all the colors are spring and autumn. During the summer months of June, July, and August, there are more visitors in the garden, so the hum and buzz of people may be louder. But this is the beauty of communing with nature, that nature teaches us to find serenity no matter how noisy or chaotic it may be outside. Because 
We know that true peace is a state of mind, a space and place you can reach on the inside, no matter what is going on around you. From mid-March to April, the cherry blossoms bloom in full pink and white. The azaleas, magnolias, and orchids all gift us their beauty and color as well. Come autumn, you will still step into a magical garden of infinite fiery reds and fading orange hues. Any season you choose is glorious. Then, of course, there is winter, when some blossoms may have fallen to the ground, and though it may not get as cold or snowy here in Japan, a stroll through the Zen gardens of San Francisco will call to mind the beautiful lines of haiku poetry. I will read you one now, titled, The Snow of Yesterday. The snow of yesterday that fell like cherry blossoms is water once again. You see, it was once a tradition among Zen monks to write a last haiku when they were about to journey from this life to the next. This haiku by a monk named Gozan was written in 1789 when he was at the ripe old age of 71. As you walk and ponder the poem, it recalls the circle of life, the metaphorical meaning of transience. Listen to it once more. The snow of yesterday that fell like cherry blossoms is water once again. You may chance upon the cherry blossoms, which although beautiful, only last a week before falling and making contact with the waiting white snow. Perhaps you even feel inspired when walking here to write some poetry yourself. So now I will give you space to sit and write, or to just ponder and reflect on the beauty of doing nothing. And when you are ready, we will continue our stroll. For more exploration through San Francisco, we can also visit Japantown. This is a lively neighborhood and a great place to learn about Japanese traditions, flowers, and food. The yearly festivals to join in here include the Northern California Cherry Blossom Festival, held for two weekends every April, and the Nihonmachi Street Fair, held one weekend in the month of August. No matter how little or how much you choose to do in San Francisco, you can always come back to the Japanese tea garden to gift your body and spirit a day of rest and reflection. Every time you return, remember the love of the gardener as he tended to his flowers and his plants here. Remember the seasons, how they change and bring us new meaning, new challenge, new joy. Remember the seeds of time planted in the soil of our hearts. When watered with care, these seeds can grow into life-giving memories. I hope you enjoyed this simple stroll in the Japanese tea gardens 
of San Francisco. I certainly enjoyed being your guide on this dreamy trip through beauty, color, and calm. As you now close your eyes and drift off into dreamland, you can take these memories of our walk together with you. Cherish the perfumed scent of those flowers you saw. Remember the rippling sounds of the water in the tranquil koi pond and the lush waterfalls. Delight in the memory of the delicious tea you savored. Keep the warmth of the garden in your heart as you rest. Good night, sweet dreams, and I'll be with you again for another journey tomorrow here on Soothing Pod. Hello. Welcome to Soothing Pod's Sleep Stories. Tonight, I will be your guide as we wander through the lush green landscape of Berlin's oldest park, the Volkspark Friedrichshain. But before we begin, let us prepare our minds and our bodies for the journey ahead and towards complete relaxation. Close your eyes. Feel every inch of your body settle into the soft mattress. Become aware of each part of your body and begin to relax. From your toes, to your legs, to your back, and then towards your shoulders. Finally, to your neck, and then to your head. Feel yourself let go, and allow yourself to drift off into another place full of peace, tranquility, and serenity. Imagine now that you feel the warm sun on your face. It feels so good on your cheeks. Constructed in 1840, this park is an emblem of Germany's Prussian past and the height of its opulence. With 52 hectares of grassy fields, tree-lined walking and biking paths, and several rushing fountains and still ponds, there will be much to see, feel, and hear as we wander together on a beautiful sunny day through this historic Berlin sanctuary. You hear the steady rush of water as it flows from one fountain chalice to another. You find yourself at the park entrance. There are two columns topped with statues of angels. You walk between a row of large manicured bushes. You are surrounded in green. You move forward slowly until you see a large fountain ahead. It is a pristine white with a semicircular arcade containing a succession of arches. 
you look up and see that there are sculptures above the arcade. Each sculpture is a depiction of an animal or a fairy tale character. A canopy of trees lay just behind the marble arcade. Benches, situated in front of the neat green blocks of bushes, border this impressive fountain. It is the perfect place to sit in the sun. Soothe your eyes with the view of the fountain's clear, rushing water. Or simply read a book. You have arrived at the Märchenbrunnen, which is also simply known as the Fountain of Fairy Tales. It is as though you have entered another time and into a beautiful magical place where anything is possible. Indeed, this artistic entrance was commissioned by the National Park in 1893. Ludwig Hoffmann designed the fountain and wanted to create an entrance that would bring a visitor back to the simplicity of childhood and the charm of fairy tales. As you walk around the neo-baroque style fountain, you feel the weariness of your day melt away. It is as though the water is washing away the dirt and heaviness from your skin. You feel cleansed and refreshed. You touch the cool pale stone and run your hands along the smooth planes of the structure. At the centerpiece of the fountain, you see four cascading waterfalls, each containing one large and nine smaller fountains. Dotted around the fountain are seven water-spouting frog figurines. You notice that one in particular stands out. It is the Frog Prince. You count ten sculptures around the fountain, ranging from images of Puss in Boots to Cinderella. Each sculpture taking you back to a moment in your childhood. You notice how at peace you are. There is only the sound of flowing water, the sound of children's laughter and birds chirping can be heard as an echo from the distance. You would like to stay here but the tapestry of green just beyond the fountain is too inviting. There is still much to see. You walk the path that leads beyond the arcade. Behind it, you reach the dolphin fountain, which has water flowing lightly to a large chalice. A larger pathway opens ahead, and you walk through the steady line of trees, until you find yourself in a panorama of green. The grass is so green and lush, 
The area is punctuated with tall trees, all with full crowns of leaves. It must have rained earlier in the day. You smell the freshness of the earth. It is the sweet, sharp scent of the grass and the woodsy aroma of the trees and soil. There is no better combination than the feel of the warm sun on your bare cheeks, paired with the scent of the fresh earth. Your eyes feel soothed at the sight of so much green. You notice that there are a few leaves that have begun to turn varying shades of orange and gold. Golden brown leaves dot the carpet of green. It is still warm, and not quite autumn, but you feel the air become crisp. You feel yourself becoming more and more relaxed as you scan the landscape. Your body slowly begins to feel restored. You see several people making the most of summer's end. Several joggers run past you. There are many families sitting on picnic blankets often with children running through the never-ending scenes of green. You take the large pathway that goes along a large playground. It is so nice to see children playing. Like the kids, you are ready for what is ahead of you. You feel a lightness inside of you. The past does not matter anymore. It is a new season, a new beginning. The chorus of children laughing and chattering merge with the other sounds of the park. The rustle of the wind blowing through the trees. Light music playing from someone's radio. Friends creating gentle beats in their drum circle. And the sound of bike wheels whirring their way around the park's pathways. You then take the path towards the large hill in front of the playground. You push yourself to climb it steadily until you reach the top. From there, you can see the sprawling city. The iconic TV Tower of Berlin stands out against the pattern of grey rooftops. Its pointed shape and unmistakable orb reflecting the sun. You take in the entire view. You feel as though you have been lifted to the top of the world. You feel your entire body become filled with light. Your body is slowly warming in the sunlight as you stand above the city. You feel a warmth in your heart that steadily grows and extends to your lungs as you breathe in. You then feel the warmth reach your belly, followed by your limbs and then to your skin. You feel as though you are glowing in the warmth of this last of summer sunlight. Your footsteps are light, even as you feel your feet on the ground. You begin to notice again what immediately surrounds you. In the plant life that surrounds you, 
You see blue, pink, and yellow flowers still in bloom. Small plants that look like little berries dot the shrubs in the area. From a distance, you can see Schönbrunn Restaurant and Biergarten. Once a former GDR pavilion, the structure is a piece of Berlin's divided history. Though modernized, the restaurant is stylishly retro. It is like peeking into a piece of the city's past. A postcard from another time in Berlin that seems to have come to life. There are small pockets of people lining up for a meal, a drink, or an ice cream. You hear the steady chatter of people. It hums through the trees and sounds like a rhythmic buzz. You see many people enjoying themselves as they relish their meal. Relaxed and without a care in the world. You feel just like them. Relaxed and living in the moment. Just in front of you is a large swan pond. You make your way towards it. Beautiful willow trees surround the still body of water. Lily pads with blooms are on the mirror-like surface. Regal swans glide through the water. They are unfazed by those gawking at their beauty. Ducks flit around the edges in search of food. Eager to head towards enthusiastic passers-by armed with breadcrumbs. You walk around the body of calm water. Until you reach several stone rocks that form a path to the Japanese pavilion. The path is no longer grass and stone. But a solid area made of red bricks. The structure is located at the edge of the pond. The Japanese pavilion that stands out, yet at the same time fits so perfectly in this peaceful environment. There is a pointed roof with edges that turn upwards. Inside the red four-columned structure is the peace bell. You once again feel as though you were transported to another time and place. It is empty at this moment. You pause. You feel the solemn stillness of this space. The large bell is in bronze, with the words World Peace carved onto it in German. Gifted by Japan to East Germany, this historic peace was given in solidarity against nuclear war and towards world peace. On each column are strings of colorful origami swans. They look beautiful as they gently sway in the wind as though in tune with the sounds of the park from a distance. On the ground are flowers, petals, and various mementos that pay homage to this sacred space. You imagine the waves and vibrations that occur if you ring the bell how it would seep into your soul and echo into the chambers of your heart. You feel every sense of your being expand. You take a deep breath in, feeling the crisp air entering your chest. You breathe out, 
A wave of calm falls over you like a silk blanket. Surrounding the Japanese pavilion are patches of green lawn and a small bridge that goes over rocks and boulders where the waterfall above leads to and flows into the pond. You hear the steady rush of water as it flows down the rocks. You see children laughing and smiling in glee as they climb up the mossy boulders onto the top of the stream of water. You take off your shoes and feel your bare feet touch the cool ground as you make your way up the rocky path. Finally, you dip your feet into the cool water, feeling it flow between your toes and nip at your ankles. Through the clear water, you see beautiful pebbles of all shapes, colors, and sizes. You reach down and pick the one that most catches your eye. You hold it in your hand, feeling the smoothness of the stone. You observe how it glistens in the sunlight. You observe the patterns that emblazon the gorgeous piece. You wonder how much water, sun, air, wind and soil this small beautiful object weathered to become so polished and pristine. You climb higher and higher up until you reach the source of the man-made waterfall. It's a large rock fountain with water spouting out from the top. Kids giggle as they reach it and splash each other. Surrounding the steady churn of the waterfall stand a variety of trees that envelop the area. It is as though another forest has opened up. There is no grass, but only cool soil. You are so far away from where you have journeyed from, yet you feel as though you have come full circle. The scent of grass and earth and dew fills your nose and down your throat and into your lungs until it reaches your feet. They are on soft, cool, solid ground. The sounds of children's laughter and rushing water begin to blend together. You feel the cool breeze sweep over your sun-kissed face. You find a spot on the grass and lay down. Above you, golden and green leaves sway overhead they rustle in the wind. The sky beyond the trees is a clear blue. Small clouds move slowly through the canvas of blue. You imagine your thoughts on each cloud slowly drift away. You feel yourself let go. Your eyes close. It is time now to embark onto the journey of sleep. I hope you enjoyed this walk through one of Berlin's many parks. Good night and sweet dreams. Please join me again tomorrow for another journey on Soothing Park. And welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. Tonight, we're going to spend some time relaxing and enjoying the beauty of a Vermont farm nestled deep within the Green Mountains. Before we begin, let us take a moment to ease ourselves into a state of comfort. Let us take a deep breath and make the room around us a safe, and peaceful space. Gently close your eyes 
give your body the attention it deserves. Are you clenching your fists or your teeth? Notice this tension and allow your body to let go of it. There is no need for tension here. You can truly let your body sink into the mattress. Feel how it welcomes you to do nothing but let go and be present. Feel the sweet sensation of your breath filling your lungs. There's a melodic rhythm to the rise and fall of your chest. That rise and fall. Rise and fall. Rise and fall. Rise and fall. The music you make to lull yourself to a gentle, restful sleep. As this rhythm continues, feel the sweet, warm sensation of that breath as it flows through your body. Starting in the center of your chest and trickling further and further until it is warming your fingertips. Now that you've found a moment of peace, let us journey to the mountains of New England. It is spring when you find yourself on a farm in Vermont. The simple red barn and white porch-wrapped house seem to pop out against the rolling green hills. Springtime brings a welcomed warmth and color to the land, land that has slumbered under sparkling white snow for several months. When the thaw comes and those first few rays of sunshine grace the grass with their presence, the world comes alive. The hill is awash with the golden glow of thousands of dandelions, all grateful and ready for the warm months to come. You journey out towards the hills of dandelions and settle onto a soft picnic blanket. You can feel the plush grass shift and cushion you underneath the cotton fabric as you lay your head down. Above you, lazy clouds meander across a bright blue sky the air around you has a distinct freshness to it, a lingering bite of the winter wind mixed with the softness of spring. Flowers, caught in the gentle breeze, seem to float across the sky in a choreographed dance. You feel at peace here. There are no obligations, no expectations, the only thing you need to do is sink into the grass and take long, deep breaths of the floral country air. You sit up to gaze over the land in the lush field to your right. Your sheep gently bleat, inviting you over. The sight of the newborn lamb fills you with a sense of peace and wonder. It rises to its shaky limbs, using its mother for comfort and guidance. It's such a pure sight, gentle, authentic, untouched by any stress that could be found in the outside world. You extend your fingers, begging the little lamb to come to you. With a tiny bleat, it brushes its head against the tips of your fingers. The touch of the lamb's sweet, soft fur instantly relaxes you. It looks up at you, innocent eyes glistening in the spring sun. You sit with the sheep for a long moment, watching them with wonder 
as you feel your body melt against the tree you're leaning on. From early spring through June, sheep bring their lambs into the world. They fit so perfectly onto your farm and bring a sense of innocence everywhere they roam. After a long while, the sheep crest over the horizon so they can settle into the security of the woods for the night. There, they will huddle together for protection and prepare for a bright new day. Above you, the sun is beginning to fade, painting the sky beautiful oranges and blues as it sinks down over the mountains. You begin the walk back to your farmhouse and settle into a chair underneath an apple tree with a warm cup of tea by your side. From here, you can see the entirety of the farm. You watch as the setting sun splashes a mosaic of color over the rolling hills. With every passing minute, the colors seem to shift and dance across the lush grass. A shower of pale pink and white apple blossoms rains over you with every gust of wind. You breathe in the sweet scent deeply as the blossoms cascade over your clothing and hair. You listen intently to the steady drone of the bumblebees dancing above your head as they fly from flower to flower a true symphony of nature's music. The sound is constant and comforting. As the sun finally dips below the horizon, a whole new vision of your farm comes to light. Here, in the mountains of Vermont, light pollution is not an issue. Due to the isolation and lack of large cities, the Green Mountains have some of the best views of the stars on the east coast. Above you, the inky black sky is peppered with thousands of flickering stars. You get lost in the otherworldly expanse of cosmic wonder. Although it's millions of miles away, you feel as if you could reach out and brush your fingers against the glistening sky like running your fingers across the surface of a cool pond. For the first time this spring, you hear the song of the crickets begin ever so slowly. It starts with a lone chirp, one single cricket singing its melody to the universe. Within a few moments, there is a chorus all around you a chorus radiating from the tree above your head to the dandelion petals on the hill. You lay your head back on the chair and look up through the apple tree blossoms at the slivers of a starry night sky. You feel your whole body release every bit of tension. The cool breeze tickles your skin as your warm jacket comforts you. Ever so slowly, you feel yourself drifting closer and closer to sleep. The last thing you hear is the drone of the crickets, the final song in the soundscape of your relaxing night. Before you know it, spring has drifted into summer. Here, summers are relatively mild warm enough to spend days lounging in the sun or floating on the lake, but just cool enough to always be comfortable. The day begins with a warm, lazy sunrise. You settle into your chair under the apple tree and watch the day around you come to life. The bees are busy in the fields of dandelions. The sheep meander sleepily to their feet and up into the grass for a nice breakfast. The routine of their lives is soothing and reliable, 
something you're always able to find comfort in. Once the sun has filled every inch of the land with light, you take a short stroll to the pond. The pond is smooth as glass, a clear reflection of the picture-perfect blue sky above. You settle into the small rowboat that rests at the edge of the water. Within moments, you're floating in a sparkling sea of blue. You fully lay back in the rowboat and feel utterly weightless as you drift further and further towards the center of the pond. You listen closely to the water, gently lapping the boat underneath your head. It drifts, then recedes, drifts, then recedes. Outside of the waves, you can hear the symphony of tiny frogs as they chirp happily in the morning sun. You too have found joy in the sun. You relish the warm, honey-like feeling of it kissing your skin as you float along. It's all so perfect. You feel yourself slowly drifting to absolute peace as the embrace of a midday slumber wraps you in its arms. Just as you're fading away, you feel a cool sprinkle of water pitter-patter across your body. Dark plumes of grey clouds have wandered over your body. A midday summer rain is common and welcome in the mountains here. It revitalizes the lush greenery and cleans the air for a cool, mild afternoon. You watch as the rain peppers the surface of the pond around you. As each individual drop sinks into the water, it leaves an expanding ring in its place. The rings seem to dance over the water, rowing at their own pace, intertwining with the circles that other raindrops have left behind. The melody of the rain instantly fills the landscape around you. You row yourself back to shore to find a drier place to watch the rain fall. As you reach the safety of your porch, you curl up in a dry wool blanket and settle into a rocking chair. The rain echoes on the antique copper roof, clinking with a distinct tink, 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 that transports you to a simple time, a simple place. At the edge of the porch, your honeysuckle bush begins to sink under the weight of the dewdrop. The fragrance of the sweet flowers fills the air. You reach forward and pluck one of the pale pink flowers from the bush. You bring it to your lips and suck the sweet nectar from the center of the flower. The sweet berry-like flavor is a welcome contrast to the cool, earthly aesthetic just outside the porch. You breathe in the beautiful weather on this relaxed summer day for a long moment, feeling blessed for all the bounty that summer brings. As quickly as the rain came in summer, autumn arrives on the farm. You awaken on a crisp fall morning and sit on the porch with a hot drink. The hills before you are ablaze with the fiery colors of the season's change. Every tree is alive with oranges and reds and browns. The vibrant leaves spill from the trees and float along in the brisk, full breeze. The dampness of autumn's approach has coated the hillside in a low morning fog. You can smell the earthy aroma of the soil and the trees as the fog drifts closer and closer to you. As fall has crept towards its peak, you've watched the apples on your tree grow with every passing day. You grab a wicker basket and wander underneath the apple tree, which is now ripe 
and ready with heavy, bright red apples. As you pluck each apple, you can't help but feel a oneness with nature. Every autumn, this glorious tree bears fruit for the birds and the deer and the humans who are fortunate enough to find it. In return, you find yourself nurturing it throughout the year, ensuring it is healthy and safe from harm. You pluck one apple that glistens with a brilliant shine. With a hearty crunch, you take your first bite of the season. As the flavor floods your mouth, you look out into the forest. In the midst of the fog, you gaze upon the fiery elegance of a red fox. It darts through the field, bounding with a type of joy and grace that is so prevalent in nature. This moment is something you want to bottle up and take with you everywhere you go. New England has some of the most incredible fall foliage in the country, but unfortunately, the beautiful colors are short-lived. Here, in the mountains, the vibrant colors will typically last for less than a month. Knowing this, you settle in to appreciate the landscape around you for as long as you can. Soon, winter sweeps through the green hills. As you step outside, the cool winter air nips at your skin awakening your senses. Winter in these mountains is a picture of tranquility and stillness. The world around you is nearly silent, a type of silence that can only be found after a plush, dense snowfall. Each step you take echoes with the crunch of the snow, and it seems to be the only sound on earth the snow encases everything in a level, sparkling blanket of white. The trees glisten and bend under a thin layer of ice that shines in the sunlight like crystal. The only imperfections in the snow are dozens of tiny animal tracks. Like a map from the universe, you can trace the steps of the animals that have visited you in the night. You find comfort knowing there are animals all around you, living in this world of white by your side. Deer prints circle your apple tree, digging in the snow for forgotten apples at its base. Tiny bird prints pepper the ground around your feeder. The world is incredibly alive around you, even though it feels so still in this moment. Overhead, a gentle snow begins to fall. The large, wet snowflakes seem to fall from the sky in slow motion, like billions of feathers descending from the heavens. The snowflakes kiss your skin and melt on contact, flushing your cheeks from their cool, soft touch. They cling to your eyelashes, just as you retreat to the safety of your living room. Here, in front of a crackling fire, you curl up in a velvety blanket. From here, you look out the large bay window into the winter wonderland just on the other side. The snow continues to dance and sway its way to the icy ground. There is peace in this moment. You're reminded that it is perfectly okay to take a step back and slow down to prepare for new things. You're reminded that even nature needs a season to rest. With tranquility radiating through your body and the snow falling just outside the window, you lay down on the couch. The glow of the fire illuminates the room in a soft, warm light. The crackling of the firewood is a steady song, inviting you to close your eyes 
and find comfort where you are. Within a few moments, you are drifting off, closer and closer to a peaceful night's sleep, a beautiful new day. I hope you've enjoyed taking this journey with me to a restful night's sleep. I'd love for you to join me for another story tomorrow. I'll be with you here again on Soothing Pod. Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pod. My name is David, and I am going to tell you a wonderful story that will lull you into a peaceful and restful sleep. Tonight, I will be your guide on a journey where we will linger on some of the most beautiful paths in Italy. But before we begin, let's take a moment to relax our mind, body, and heart. Let's enjoy a quiet moment just learning to be still. It was the great Leonardo da Vinci who wrote many years ago, Principles for the development of a complete mind. Study the science of art. Study the art of science. Develop your senses. Learn how to see. Realize that everything connects to everything else. And so, that is exactly what we are going to do tonight. Realize that our breath connects to our spirit, our spirit to our soul, and our soul to our mind. And only by stilling and calming our mind can we find the peace we seek for a good night's sleep. So, I want you to simply take that calm moment now to be still. Feel your body sink onto your mattress. The weight and cares of the day grow heavy, but you allow them. You allow the bed and your pillow to hold everything up, and you breathe inward, outward. And now, imagine that you are standing on a beautiful beach its pebbles stretched as far as one can wander. But it is not an ocean beach. No, this is the beautiful, pristine Lake Como, just north of Milan. And the year is a medieval one, the 1400s. The sky is clear, and in your view of the lake, you see not just an enormous body of water, but the clefts of mountains that rise and fall along it. These are alpine peaks, and they stretch all the way to Switzerland creating a natural boundary between two very different lands. From your side of the mountains, in Italy, the sun seems to be always shining. And here on Lake Como, a steady, reassuring wind blows. Here, the days are simple, and the hours seem long yet they are always beautiful. Alpine peaks above, Lake Como waters below, you in between. Time seems nowhere, and everywhere 
in the same moment. Swans glide across the water gracefully. They are not in a hurry, and neither are you. As you walk along the lake, you turn on a little path that climbs upwards, towards terraced vineyards, pumpkin patches, donkeys and livestock. During pauses under the shade of chestnut trees, you stop to breathe and take in the moment. Below, you see the sails of little boats crisscrossing the water. And if Leonardo da Vinci were beside you, this is what he would say. The sunbeams which penetrate the openings interposed between clouds of various density and form illuminate all the places over which they pass. Dark places are only seen in the intervals between the rays. Those were words he wrote to his art students, and today, the light you see beyond entirely fits this description. For Leonardo da Vinci, also known as the Renaissance man, loved nature. His sketches were based on many of the same scenes you see before you. In fact, he really did this way in the late 1400s while working for the Duke of Milan. It would have been more than a day's journey on foot from Milan, but he loved the communion with nature. He hardly passed the opportunity to seek inspiration for his portraits from the people and animals he saw all over the countryside of northern Italy. Leonardo da Vinci was one of history's greatest geniuses, but at the same time he was a simple man. The path of Leonardo, a way to trace his exact trails, is still walkable 500 years later. It is based on a book by author Renato Ornaghi, who recently mapped out the exact trails so that travelers to Italy could follow in da Vinci's footsteps. The path of Leonardo starts in Milan, then heads north towards Lake Como continuing over ancient roads and rivers before arriving at the foot of the Alps near the Swiss border. In total, you can journey for 240 kilometers if you divide the time into 12 slow trekking days. It was through three things that Leonardo da Vinci adhered to that his genius thrived. Experience. Observe. Experiment. He would tell his students. And he also noted, though human genius in its various inventions with various instruments may answer the same end, it will never find an invention more beautiful or more simple or direct than nature. In her inventions, nothing is lacking and nothing is superfluous. Da Vinci developed his own way to comprehend the world and referred to himself as a disciple of experience. As he walked the earth and sketched it, this act of movement and connection helped him imagine ways to improve life for humanity. Whether studying the intricate inner organs of a human body, or 
the sweeping contours of an Italian landscape, he examined the source. Consider in your walks the different actions of men, he wrote. When they are talking or quarreling, when they laugh and when they fight. Be quick in sketching these with slight strokes in your pocketbook, which should always be about you. Preserve these sketches as your assistants and masters. Following his instructions, artists in the late 1400s embraced the idea of learning to see by studying real life. But in some cases, the deceased. When he moved from Florence to Milan, Leonardo was in his early thirties. So, you can imagine that his youthful body was eager to physically explore as he wandered on foot. In 1492, he travelled through Lombardy's Valtellina region, visiting Lake Como, Chiavenna, and Valsassina. But truth be told, he wasn't merely wandering. He was researching ways to design better bridges, mechanisms, and artillery for the Duke. He was training his mind to truly see. The life he designed for himself in Milan spurred the Renaissance. His sketches captured the moment of idea and possibility. Centuries later, that creative and curious mind still fascinates us. As you continue your walk along Lake Como, you'll wonder at its beauty. Here, nothing is hurried, not even the ducks. They lazily glide along with swans, knowing and trusting that a traveller may come along to offer bread. As you walk around here, pay attention to the ombre mezzani, or intermediate shadows that da Vinci wrote about. Note how the hues of blue fade and nearly blend with the deepest parts of the water. On a less sunny day, you may see peaks of village roofs through the fog. No day in Lake Como is absent of beauty. The lower contours of distant objects will be less discernible than their upper boundaries, said Da Vinci and this occurs especially with mountains and hills. You might decide to start your walk with Da Vinci in Milan, put on some good flat walking shoes, and head to the Ambrosiana Library. It was one of the first libraries that opened its doors to all who could read or write. The Codex Atlanticus manuscript is here, and one can spend hours poring over its worn and browning pages. Then there is the famous gigantic bronze horse sculpture in San Siro. This monumental statue was based on da Vinci's design. Another beautiful and unique spot in Milan are the Leonardo's vineyards in Casa degli Atellani. While working on the Last Supper, Leonardo tended these tiny vineyards. The white Malvasia grape is still cultivated nearby and sold in the small cafe on site so that you can stop and sip the same refreshing wine Da Vinci may have enjoyed.
for more interesting color, stroll along the Navili. They are historical canals that were also influenced by the great artist's designs. Here, you may linger taking in a sunset as the light settles with a glow over the canals, or simply have a drink while people watching, listening to a street musician entertaining the crowds. On weekends, there are markets and exhibited art to observe and enjoy. But for a day of doing nothing but meditating, it is the tranquil Piona Abbey near Colico, overlooking Lake Como, that one should walk to, run by Cistercian monks, also accessible by boat. It was a favorite stopover for Da Vinci. Did you know? that locals say its bell tower is the same one depicted in the famous painting, The Last Supper. On a sunny day, you might try to walk along the El Sentiero di Viandante, or Path of the Wanderers in Upper Lake Como. Once atop these hills, you will recognize the bird's eye view of the lake as possibly the same one in one of Leonardo's many sketches. If you choose to simply sit and bask in fresh air, reading a book, or simply doing nothing, then the Pian de España Nature Reserve is perfect. You will find it near Lago di Mezzola, an enchanting protected reserve where wild birds are free to roam. But there is almost nothing more enrapturing than seeing the waterfalls of Chiavenna up close and personal. Da Vinci mentions the Aqua Fragia waterfalls as well in his notebooks. Enjoy the way the water rushes down. It is both powerful and graceful descending and blessing the earth with its bounties. And although the water crashes and splashes against boulders, it is a thing of great beauty. It doesn't force its presence. For no cost at all, you can experience the rushing waters up close bathing in its streams on a spring or summer day. The desire to know and discover more of the world and its secrets drove Leonardo da Vinci to try to look at the earth from a higher perspective, a dimension above. So, da Vinci also climbed the alpine passes to get a greater view. And what a view it is from the snowy peaks. Nowadays, of course, travelers will drive over the mountain ranges, heading for ski resorts in the winter, or enjoying a spa in summer. Leonardo da Vinci was also a fan of relaxation. He must have known the secrets of silence and mindfulness being fully aware of present moments. Every now and then, go away. Have a little relaxation. For when you come back to your work, your judgment will be surer, he said. The next time you plan to travel to Italy, don't forget about this beautiful place, not known to many tourists. When they think of Milan, they think of shopping. And when one hears Lake Como, it is often associated with the plush celebrity life. But if one looks past the villas, past the glitter, past the luxury yachts, there is more. 
the sleepy villages around the lake, a flock of sheep or goats, the slow and laborious job of a vineyard grower, a group of happy children splashing in the sun, or a couple of grandmas sunbathing by the baking pebbles. Stop a while, as da Vinci did. Take in a sunset or a sunrise. Allow more time to wander, to seek the silence, to be renewed. Just do not forget a dip in the waters of Lake Como, for this is also a sweet and simple refreshment. And as you go for a leisurely swim by that beach, remember the words of the Renaissance man in rivers. The water that you touch is the last of what has passed, and the first of that which comes. So, with present time, I hope you enjoyed imagining this walk with da Vinci, and that it has brought you some peace as you settle down to rest. Thank you for joining me for another adventure on Soothing Pod. I do hope you'll be back tomorrow for more. Good night, and sweet dreams. Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pod's Sleep Stories. Tonight, I will be your guide on a relaxing journey through the beautiful Sagano Bamboo Forest in Kyoto, Japan. We will explore miles of tranquil dirt paths underneath swaying bamboo stalks, and learn the history of the elegant temples peppered throughout this beloved forest. Before we begin our journey, let us first take a moment to center ourselves and leave our work and worries behind. Now is the time to unwind and let go. For a moment, lay on your back. Feel the comfort of the bed underneath you, how it invites you to melt into the mattress and relax all your muscles. There is no need for tension in your body. Let the mattress support your neck and legs. With every breath, allow yourself to sink more and more into the soft cushion beneath you. You are safe here. Make yourself comfortable. As you take a deep breath in, really pay attention to the way the air feels as it fills your lungs. Feel the moment that breath gives you as it travels from your chest down to the tips of your toes and out through your fingers. As you exhale, allow yourself to sink even deeper into the mattress. Now that you are ready, let us begin. Our journey begins at the very edge of Sagano Bamboo Forest on a chilly spring morning. You can see your breath drift in the air around you. You pull your soft jacket closer against your skin and are instantly comforted by the plush fabric and warmth. Before you is a sight unlike any other. Thousands of bamboo stalks line a peaceful dirt path. You take your first step down the path, your eyes locked onto the bamboo around you. So tall, it seems as if they are kissing the early morning sky. Between their tall stalks, you can see bits and pieces of the yellow and orange sunrise, a beautiful mosaic that you can piece together. 
each beam of dawn light seems to sparkle in the low morning mist, illuminating this forest as a world of its own. It is empty here. You can hear the gentle crunch of the gravel underneath your feet. You lay your hand on the smooth bamboo fence as you continue to walk at your own pace. As you drift further and further into this otherworldly forest, you pause to listen. The wind weaves through the stalks, clinking them together with each gentle gust. The sound of bamboo is unlike any other, almost like a hollow rain or a gentle hail. The empty, towering bamboo is a percussion instrument all its own. You listen for a long moment. What few leaves the bamboo stalks have rustle in the breeze. The clink of the bamboo, the whisper of the leaves. The clink of the bamboo, the whisper of the leaves. You feel for a moment as if you could stay here forever. The sound is lulling you further, further, and further still towards complete and total relaxation. You feel your body melting as the rhythm of nature's sweetest noises whisks you away to a type of tranquility you never knew existed. You sit on a bench for a moment allowing your body to relax. You close your eyes, a swirl of soft, soft light green swirls on your eyelids. It sways back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You feel your eyelids getting heavier as the color continues to dance. It's a soothing green, a natural and fresh color that puts your body and mind at ease. The soundtrack around you, the wind clink, clink, clinking the bamboo, the susurrus of those bright leaves. The plants around you have an important place in Japanese culture, long believed to be a symbol of prosperity and protection. Bamboo has been used in cuisine, architecture, and furniture for centuries. That tranquil sound around you is the world renowned as a symbol of Japan. In 1996, Japan began an initiative to counter the noise pollution of our busy world and invite people to respect the beautiful environment around them. Called the 100 Soundscapes of Japan, the program decided on 100 distinct, tranquil noises that reflect Japan and the beautiful landscapes around it. The Kagano Forest is one of the most well-known soundscapes from the list. Like you, in this moment, People often dream of being under the swaying bamboo stalks, soaking in their calming noises. You open your eyes. The green on your eyelids is replaced by the dancing green bamboo before your eyes. Everything seems soft here. The air, the breeze, the colors. You begin to walk again. Something in you seems to have shifted. An anxiety, stress, or hesitation that you were carrying has completely melted away. Every step you take seems so much lighter. You are floating, weightless. You embrace this feeling as you continue to drift through the sea of green. The air filling your lungs is sweet and soft. With every breath, you feel your body slowing down and settling into this beautiful space. The aroma is earthy and green, like leaves 
right after a light rain. You enter a small clearing. Before you is the Nonomiya Shrine. The shrine was an important part of Japanese culture for centuries. Sao women, who were unmarried daughters of emperors, were sent on pilgrimages to live and serve at the shrine of the sun goddess, Amaterasu. To begin their pilgrimage, these young women were sent to Nonomiya Shrine for a year to be purified. You pause to truly take in the shrine around you and its long-standing history. As you enter the shrine, you pass under a Tory gate, an ancient doorway meant to represent stepping from the ordinary world to the sacred one. Unlike the bright red Tory gates you often see in Japan, the gate above you is a simple wooden arch. You marvel for a moment at the beauty and peace in its simple design. It feels as if it was always meant to be in this forest, shaded under swaying bamboo stalks, soaking in the aroma of the fresh plants. The buildings around you are simple wooden frames with brightly colored decorations, tinkering against one another in the wind. You walk past the many buildings and under the Tory gates. Something feels utterly sacred in this place. You can hear birds chirping in the forest all around you. Their calls seem to echo off the ancient buildings and ring back even softer, even more melodic. To your right, in several of the buildings, are beautifully painted trinkets all of which resemble women. The shrine is a place where women have been coming for centuries to find comfort and peace. Amulets in the booth that provide luck for marriage, conception, health, and childbirth shine in the tree-filtered sunlight. Your soft footsteps bring you to the end of the shrine. To your right, a garden unlike any other glistens with the morning dew. There is a rolling hill coated in plush, delicate moss. Just the sight of it makes you sleepy and helps you find a moment of peace. It looks too perfect for this world. A true bed of satiny earth. Tiny wooden bridges crisscross this serene garden. You stand there for a long moment. The dignity and simplicity of this shrine are incredibly comforting. You feel a sense of respect and of belonging, an understanding that anywhere can truly be home. You continue down the dirt path, you can hear your breath and the pitter-patter of your feet on the dirt walkway. How refreshing it is to find solitude like this, to be able to stray from the everyday noises of the city. Here, you feel at peace with yourself. You feel as though you are truly part of the nature that is all around you. You enter a pathway and find yourself at Tenryuji Temple. Several stark white buildings stand regal and pristine. Their sloped roofs seem to reach up and touch the bright blue sky. Just beyond the temple, a vast mountain sits against the rising sun. The trees coating the mountain look like a vivid impressionist painting Flowers of all kinds have bloomed to welcome this first breath of spring with gratitude. With that spring air, the weeping cherry blossom trees have begun to show their colors. One of the most fleeting blooms of any plant, the cherry blossom tree makes up for it with its beauty. Winding curved branches sprout baby pink flowers, 
The entire tree is ablaze with the soft pink blossoms that pop against the blue sky. It seems the pair were made for one another. You nestle underneath one of the cherry blossom trees. You pour yourself a cup of tea and lay back in the grass, staring up at the flowers above you. Like gentle snow, the blossoms drift off the tree and into the air. Down, down, down they float at the mercy of the wind. The blossoms rain down on your blanket and into your hair. You breathe in the steam from your hot tea, and with it, catch the heavenly aroma of the cherry blossoms resting in your hair and on your jacket. You watch the flowers for a long, peaceful moment. Some things just seem too delicate for this world, too perfect. In Japan, every spring, thousands of families and friends journey to cherry blossom parks for hanami, the Japanese tradition of flower viewing. Loved ones gather to enjoy one another's company and breathe in the beautiful, fleeting blossoms of the cherry trees as they eat homemade picnics. For a moment, you imagine a loved one sitting there with you. You imagine their smile against the pink and blue backdrop, their laugh intertwining with the chirps of the birds nestled in the flowers. You take one last sip of your hot tea. You feel it as it radiates warmth through your whole body, starting at your stomach, then spreading all the way to the tips of your fingers. You pass under the drizzle of cherry blossoms until you come to a large pond. The water is like glass, with a stunning reflection of the mountain before you. The whole pond seems to blush with the glow of the flowers hovering over it and falling into it. You step closer to see that the pond is coated with lotus flowers. Amongst green, smooth lily pads, their rosy leaves have just begun to fall as spring comes into full swing. You can't help but marvel at the fact that they are blooming here out of all places. Tiny frogs nestle against the flowers as they live their life, undisturbed among the flowers. You stare into the water for a long moment, your body fully relaxed by the tranquility of the grounds of this sacred temple. A small ripple appears on the water, then another. You look up to the sky to see that dark clouds have started to move in. Even though the blue sky has been tucked away for now, everything around you appears even more beautiful. The cherry blossoms pop against the grey sky. People chatter quietly as they scurry into the stunning, ancient buildings around you. You watch as the frogs in the pond close their eyes in pure bliss as the rain runs over their skin. You stop to put your hat on, but you decide against it. The feeling of each drop hitting your skin seems to make you feel even more connected to this beautiful place and the world it resides in. You begin your walk back into the forest from where you came. You walk even more slowly this time, breathing in every moment that you can the once subtle smell of the bamboo and the forest seems to be fully alive now. The earthy, fresh smell of the soil and the bamboo seems to soothe your whole body. You breathe more deeply, and with each breath, you feel more and more delighted. The sound of clinking bamboo is joined by the pitter-patter of rain. It seems to echo on the bamboo stalks, a low, full sound that fills the air, 
you listen deeply as you walk. The crunch of your footsteps seems to fade under the soundscape of the bamboo. As you once again approach Nonomiya's shrine, you slow your pace even more. Something about this rainfall transforms this sacred place. The sound of the rain dancing on the bamboo roofs and Tory archways invites you to close your eyes, to find solace in the embrace of nature. But you look at these rain-slicked buildings, the puddles forming on the ancient stone staircases, the drops that are trailing off the heavy leaves overhead, and you feel as though you are visiting Japan hundreds of years ago. You can practically see the Sao strolling back to the buildings, holding the poetry against their chests as they looked for comfort in the shrine's buildings. You imagine them looking out into the rain with a cup of tea as they began to recite their poems, the sound of their words as beautiful as the sound of the water flickering against the soil. You bid the shrine farewell as you continue through the last bit of the forest. The rain is coming down harder now, creating puddles at your feet. In the puddles, you see the reflection of the vibrant green bamboo just over your head. As you reach the exit of the forest, you listen intently for one more brief moment. The sounds of this place will remain with you forever. You pull your jacket tightly around your body, immensely comforted by the warmth and beauty of a place like this. The memories of the bamboo forest will stay with you tonight and for many nights to come. I hope you enjoyed our walk through this tranquil world of nature. Sweet dreams, and I'll be with you again tomorrow, here on Soothing Pod. Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pod Sleep Stories. My name is David, and I am going to tell you a wonderful story that will lull you into a peaceful and restful sleep. Tonight, I will be your guide on a delicious adventure, and you will get the chance to go on a culinary journey to one of the most sensuous countries in the world, Italy. But before we begin, let's take a few quiet moments to be still and be grateful. Let's be grateful for the food that we already have available to us in our homes and grocery stores. Let's be grateful for the farmers who till the ground and grow our crops, for those who transport them from the land to the factories. Also, be grateful for those who package and ship the edible goods across cities, countries, continents. Be grateful always to live in a time when spices and ingredients from the other side of the world can be exported, traded, and accessed quite easily. Then, let us turn our attention to gratefulness for our bodies in this moment. The fact that we are free to eat, and sometimes feast, and if you are blessed to have company to share your meals with, then here is another good reason to smile. As you think of these happy thoughts, allow your body to relax. Feel good under your blankets. And imagine that we are bound for a country whose cuisine and culture is as diverse as the influences that make it what it is today. 
Italy. Are you ready? Let's begin. Across Italy, you'll find good food, no matter where you travel. What's a little harder to find is the experience of that dish beyond your plate. When you arrive on new soil and attempt a foodie journey, there are a few things to try to understand. Where it came from? Who sourced it? Who made it? How often? And why? Now, we board the train from Milan to Lake Como. A light in the city of Como, and hop on another bus to a tiny village overlooking the water. Its name is Lovino, and if you blink your eyes, you might just miss it. Tiny drops of rain cool the sidewalk as we alight from the bus. A gorgeous mist hangs low, shifting under grey skies. The lake is calm. And as we walk uphill from the bus stop, it comes more fully into view. Pliny the Elder and many other writers and poets came here for inspiration. The locals will tell you that somewhere along the banks, George Clooney himself has a villa. There are quite a few villas around here. Their arched terraces are framed with lilies and hanging azalea. Purple hues of blossoms cling serenely against stone walls and terracotta rooftops. Today is special because we have been invited to Hotel Lovino to join a cooking lesson with Chef Paolo and our good friend Sara. Sara greets us with a warm hug. She runs a little bed and breakfast here on the lake where she was born and raised. Her enthusiasm for travel is matched by her desire to bring deep experiences to foreign visitors like you and me. Today, you are making three types of pasta, she smiles. A delicious scent wafts out of the kitchen as we enter. Paolo, chef and instructor, is tall and greets us with a jolly demeanor. He kisses your cheek twice, as they do in these parts of Italy. The scent is a rich tomato sauce infused with wine and cooked with a mix of pork and beef. I started early on the sauce, he explains as we enter the kitchen, because it's best to cook it for three hours. You smile in reply as Paolo motions with his hands in between stirring the pot and giving Sara instructions. We start with carrots. Can you chop a few? You oblige and reach out for a big bunch of the bright orange carrots. Paolo tells you to cut them very small, and so you do carefully. The crunch of the fresh vegetables slicing on the chopping board. When finished chopping, you hand Paolo the carrots, and he drops them into the pot. Next, he produces a bottle of local wine, and splashes an unmeasured amount into the pot of ragu. As if he is a magician, narrating the steps of his show, Paolo tells you his cooking secrets. We add the wine, let it evaporate, then add the tomato passata and allow everything to cook. Keep stirring it. Next, he leads us to a work table in the dining hall, which 
directly faces the view of the lake. Not a bad place at all for a morning's labor. On the work table, he hands each of us 100 grams of coarse semola flour, a dash of water, and nothing else. Semola flour is a special type of flour in Italy, used for a special type of pasta. Because, if you think you know flour, think again. When you arrive in Italy, you might notice the farina di grano tenero, a soft grain flour, while another kind, farina di grano duro, a hard grain flour, is also used. You see, in this country, there are two basic types of wheat grown and used in Italy. Grano tenero and grano duro. Sometimes called by the English-speaking world Durham wheat. Durham flour is what locals call semola. But if you run it between your fingers, you will find that its texture is much grainier than flour. Indeed, there are different grades of graininess in Italian flour, and each produces a different textured pasta. Today, we are using the grainy semola flour to make our first type of pasta, orecchietta, directly translated as little ears is a type of pasta originally from Puglia. Puglia is southern in the region, found right on the heel of Italy's boot. Besides its wonderful coastline and beaches, hill towns and farmland, Puglia is also famous for its cuisine. Paolo shows us how to add the water to the semola pasta and we mix this paste with our bare hands until it forms a strong, shapeable consistency. We feel like kindergarten tots with all the time in the world, and each a pot of delightful Play-Doh. To shape the little ears of Orecchietta, Paolo shows us how to slice little discs of dough then carefully roll the knife sideways across it, creating a long curl. With a deft thumb, we then flip that curl inside out. This motion creates a bowl-shaped ear to catch the sauce. And these little ears are the orecchietta. Next. Paolo instructs us on how to make the other two types of pasta using a mini hand roller or pasta making machine. Helping each other hold each end of our pasta sheets, we carefully feed the flattened flour through the machine. One of us rolls the hand crank and out come the perfectly cut strings of tagliatella. Tagliatella is a type of pasta whose name comes from the Italian tagliari, or to cut, and is often eaten in the Emilia-Romana region. It is a flatter, thicker pasta than the spaghetti known across the world, and the best for making a beef ragu. Then we mold farfalle little butterflies, famous in Lombardy, and popular with children. Farfalle pasta is smaller, shaped like butterfly wings, and are often eaten as a salad on hot summer days, but is also delicious with any type of sauce such as pesto and a shaving of pecorino sheep's cheese or parmesan on top. Presently, Company arrives. Rosanna, Sarah's mother, is an elegant-looking woman with a smile as bright as her daughter's. 
there stands an adorable old man at her side, Sarah's grandfather. He is dressed simply, with an elegant silk scarf wrapped around his neck. He grins at us, shakes our hands, and watches as we pressed curves of orecchietta onto a well-flowered tray. The next step of the process of pasta making is simple. When all the noodles are shaped and dusted with flour to keep them from sticking together, Paolo tells us to simply bring the water to a boil and cool each type of pasta accordingly. Soon, the table is set, with a view of the lake outside and the warmth of a steaming feast within. We settle into our assigned chairs and prepare to eat. Paolo fills our glasses with a robust Veltelina red wine, a wine that comes from a deep blue grape called Nebbiolo. Sara enters and bathes the first servings of tagliatella with steaming sauce, the ragu we have just finished cooking. Then, Rosanna heaps a generous portion of the handmade pasta on her father's plate. He cautiously rolls up the cuffs of his sleeves before reaching for a taste. Is it good, Papa? asks Rosanna. Does it taste like Nonna's? One bite, and then another. The smile between his eyes says it all. My grandmother made arecchietta every Sunday, explains Rosanna the light in her eyes growing brighter with the old man's approval of the home-cooked dish. It was always the Sunday lunch. Paolo has one final instruction. More wine. You nod and join in to clink glasses with the others. Sarah's grandfather raises his glass to congratulate our cooking. Salute! Chin Chin, we are all relieved. An hour later, we are still feasting. For by now, the pavement outside has started to become wet with a slight rain. The mist over the lake still hangs low. But even then, it is magical, beautiful. And with rich food, good company, and a lazy rain outside, who is in a hurry to be anywhere else? Dining this way feels indulgent, not because of extraordinary food. Noodles, no matter where eaten, are a simple dish. But because today, tonight, we have all the time in the world. As you take another bite, you try to remember the instructions that Paolo has given you, and vow to write them down the next time a paper and pen are within reach. Recipe for homemade tagliatella with meat ragu. For the pasta, 300 grams of flour, three eggs, one pinch of salt. For the ragu sauce, 200 grams of beef, 50 grams of bacon, half an onion, one carrot, one stick of celery, a couple of tomatoes, one glass of red wine, broth, two tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil, Salt to taste, pepper as needed. And lastly, Chef Paolo's instructions. Start by browning the bacon in a few tablespoons of oil, and then add the vegetables. Next, add the meat and brown it. 
Sprinkle this with wine. Let the alcohol evaporate and breathe in the scent of something delicious. Next, add the tomato paste, salt, pepper, and a little broth. Cook over low heat for a couple of hours, adding more broth if necessary. While the ragu is bubbling, mix the flour with the eggs and a pinch of salt. Work the dough until you get a mixture of firm consistency. Roll out the dough into very thin sheets and cut into strips about one centimeter wide. Boil in plenty of salted water until al dente. Drain and season with plenty of sauce. Today, we experienced the pleasure of creating an artful, unforgettable memory. This is the vitality of a nourishing meal and the sweet comfort of family. Indeed, in Italy, living is a never-ending celebration of the senses, the pleasure of time, very long lunches, and on most days, the pasta. I hope you enjoyed this culinary journey, and that you will come back for more. Who knows where our adventures will take us next time? Or what delicious dreams we have waiting for us as we fall asleep. Until next time, sweet dreams, good night, and I'll be with you next time on Soothing Pod. Hello. And welcome to Soothing Pod's Sleep Stories. Tonight, I will be your guide on a wonderful journey to the forested region of Czechia, in the heart of Central Europe. Come with me on an adventure where all that is asked of you is that you remain still exactly where you are. Allow me to bring your mind your heart and your body to a place where all is peaceful, quiet, bliss. Lie down, allowing your body to sink into the mattress. Feel your neck become heavy, its weight held up by your soft pillow. Are you ready to travel to Czechia? All you need is a tiny bit of imagination. To enter a world where everything I'm about to tell you truly exists. In the highlands of Czechia's Vysočina region, there is a rare and special hideaway, known to a few who travel here, to experience the bliss of doing nothing. Imagine, if you can, the quietness of a hidden spa resort tucked away in a secret, lush, silent forest. Here, no cars are allowed, no sound of an engine hum, no pollution, no distractions. It is summer, and a rare warmth has crept over the entire land, lulling its inhabitants with lavender blossoms mossy green lakes, and hills that seem to stretch for miles. The sounds you may hear, perhaps, are the whistle of birds, the hooves of horses, and the footsteps of Resmi, the beautiful Indian masseuse who is trained in the art of Ayurveda. Resmi guides you into a small room where a single bed lies waiting for you. She hands you a bathrobe, lets you settle onto the massage table, and asks you to close your eyes. Now you are here, 
flat on your back, eyes closed, head tilted upward, hints of coconut and musky herbs surround you. Stillness is a good place to start. The caress of oil from a copper funnel above spills down like silk. It settles onto your forehead before sinking towards your temples and deep into the roots of your hair. Resmi massages your scalp. She is gentle yet firm. Her thumbs press on mama or the acupressure points of your head. She moves the funnel above your face so that the silk coconut oil falls in figure eights on your forehead, soothing all your senses. What you are experiencing is Shirodhara, an ancient Indian wellness treatment. Ayurveda practitioners say that this space between the eyebrows sometimes called the sixth chakra or third eye, is the seat of spiritual intuition. Stimulating it helps blood circulation, but it can also bring clarity of thought, imagination, and something we all crave, deep, delicious sleep. There are many spas in Czechia It is a country known for wellness resorts, healing spring water, and relaxation in nature. But here, in the Svata Katerina Wellness and Spa Resort, you will find a unique world, one with 11 skilled yogis, doctors, and chefs, who will work patiently and diligently, day after day. They are all from India. The Svata Katerina Wellness and Spa Resort lies in that hidden forest between the bustling cities of Prague and Brno. It is a world away from commercial attractions, but those who come here come for the stillness. Getting here is easy and efficient by train. Once you arrive, There is only the slow way of life, eating vegetarian menus, strolling the gardens, meditating in the forest or by the lakes, horseback riding at leisure. Here, the Ayurveda way is a journey, not a destination. Rather than booking an overnight stay or going as quickly as they come, Guests choose programs that last four days or more. But you are welcome to stay as long as a week or more, imbibing the fresh, invigorating air, letting it renew your senses, giving you strength for the days to come. If you are lucky, you might chance upon Thomas and Carolina, the horse trainers, riding their animals bareback in the nearby lake. They are taking the glorious beasts for a swim in the summer sunlight. You might watch behind the shadow of a bush, the way they slowly guide the magnificent horses, coaxing them into the water. Never a rushed or hurried move, never a jolt that may set the animals into any kind of frenzy. And then there is Dr. Sanjay, the resident physician, who often holds conferences and talks for anyone who wants to learn about the pure, simple, and stress-free way of life. Just as we have the technology for external well-being, you may hear him speak. So do we have the technology for inner well-being. Ayurveda, he will tell you, is an age-old practice from India. 
It's the belief that only when our mind, body, and spirit are in complete balance, our bodies are also whole and healthy. Rather than finding cures for diseases, Ayurveda promotes a healthy lifestyle. It is the belief that we need to know how to balance changes, how to accept the seasons as they come and as they go, how to live according to the changes that take place in the universe, never out of pace, unbalanced, too noisy or fretful, always in tune, in step, in time, in rhythm. For the rejuvenation program, the resort employs a healthy way of eating as well. Breakfast is a delectable fruit salad and spicy carrot chutney. For lunch, crunchy bean sprouts and fresh cucumbers, buttery zucchini rice, masala bell peppers, and palada payasam, a sweet rice dessert from far away Kerala. The cashews and raisins balance out the strong, fragrant cardamom. On the dinner menu, there is an array of color and vitamin-rich vegetables. Violet beetroot, mustard-infused roti, and a light tomato salad. And if you choose to stay longer, there is half a yoga to learn, and more Shuradhara bliss to discover. You choose the slow and relaxing exercises to boost your mood, and arrive in the yoga center. Resmi will glide barefoot across the gym floor, motioning you to take a seat on the yoga mat. She's not just a masseuse, but also a certified Ayurveda practitioner and yoga instructor. The Hatha yoga session begins with Resmi's mantra, a low, lingering Om. Her pitch might take you by surprise. Such a powerful, passionate voice for such a tiny frame as hers. It's a synchronized breath, a single exhale. How does she do that, you may wonder. But then, you will learn that there is no need to ask. Just follow and flow as she leads you into Shirodhara. The flow begins. Uninterrupted by time or family issues or thoughts of work and deadlines, you simply follow Rejmi's prompts. Gracefully, you move into poses and stretches. It's all so relaxing and energizing at the same time. If at any point you are unable to hold the flexed poses, don't worry. The yoga session is not rushed, and neither should you be. Tonight is about the moments you spend with yourself in silence and peace. And so, you linger long over those peaceful thoughts and feelings, just holding space open for contentment and gratitude. Today, there is no hurrying, no deadline, no duties, except to be at peace with yourself, to see yourself for how you truly are, a miracle of life, a moment in time, yes, but also a soul whose light will live on for eternity. You stay in this shivasana pose, back flat, pelvis slightly tilted upward, palms unclenched. You inhale, filling your lungs with fresh, clean air. You exhale, into the space of peace just created, 
and surround yourself with that breath of life. Resmi will wait for you, a gentle smile on her lips. If you giggle, she may reprimand you, but still with a smile and an encouraging nod. She may even tell you softly about Anna Rosenberg, the countess who lived in the 1500s, a widow of Grades Kralove, who liked to use the water from the St. Katerina Springs. While staying in Zorovnitsya, she came to St. Katerina with her farm servants and experienced the miracle water. During the reign, of Adam I. Hrades from 1507 to 1531, Puchatke was often visited by a wide variety of distinguished guests. It was said that the St. Katerina Spa, with its healing water, served to relieve the sick coming here. Afterwards, the healing powers of the springs were legendary. Whether people still believe in its magic or not, they still come to be mesmerized by the simple nature and an unobstructed holiday. Later, you are allowed to wander. And so you do, strolling through the gardens, letting the sunlight kiss your now stretched and warmed body. Its diamond slivers stream through the tree-lined alley. Only the rustling of wind breaks the silence. It may seem, as your mind wanders, a curious thing that Rejmi would leave a life in India to pursue a career in Europe and relocate with her family. How she works, professionally, with grace and a smile, is commendable. If you have ever had to say goodbye to a familiar space, family, or friends, if you have ever had to uproot your own life, then you know of the struggle that is life overseas. New lands, new languages, new challenges to face. And yet, it is the changing seasons that often sweep you into the place of growth, maturity, and understanding needed to accept life and its flow, and the rhythm of its days. If these thoughts come and go, simply let them. Allow yourself to slip into that unconscious state of acceptance. Allow whatever makes your body feel alive. Let whatever brings your spirit joy seep into all of your senses. Inhale and exhale as your breathing slows. Reflect on how universal patterns and seasons may appear in your daily life and nightly moments of repose. Wellness is a way of living. It's not some perfect place you try to arrive at. A healthy life is a changing, moving, growing life. It's a creative one. After 90 minutes, Resmi wakes you with a whisper. You have been on her massage table all this time remembering a perfect day in the spa resort and how you lingered over each mindful moment. How is it? She whispers, telling you it is okay to fall back asleep. Where did time go? Now, you feel as if you could stay under this Shiradhara spell forever. Yet, life is waiting. Life, with its beautiful energy and change, its sweet movement and unprecedented challenges, you are ready now, inside the flow, eyes still closed, heart wide open. 
perfect. You reply. And if you wish to stay in this trance, this state of rest for a little while longer, you may simply keep your eyes closed and drift off into dreamland, a blanket of bliss. I hope you enjoyed our journey to enchanted Czechia. I will be with you again tomorrow, and if you wish to come with me, we will discover another delightful place in another corner of this wonderful world. Good night, sweet dreams. I'll be with you again tomorrow, right here on Soothing Pod. Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pod. My name is David, and tonight I will be your guide as we journey to a peaceful, quiet night's rest. This time, we are taking a trip to the tall and magical mountains of Saxony, on the border of Germany and Czechia, where these mystical boulders and formations themselves feel a world away. But before we start our journey. Let's relax, settle down, and get warm and cozy. If anything has been on your mind, or clouding your thoughts, simply let them go. Allow yourself permission to put aside any cares of the day and enjoy a simple story. The Ore Mountains of Saxony stand overlooking a region known for its traditional folk art, rich history and culture and these awe-inspiring rock formations are one of the most unique features of the region. Travelers have been coming this way for centuries to enjoy the views and take nature all in. The beautiful scenery, thick forests and rolling hills in this special part of Germany attract thousands of both adventurous and slower travelers every year. Hikers enjoy the peace of being a part of the spectacular natural forms, and climbers love attempting to scale the otherworldly formations. The area is so breathtaking that the mining cultural landscape of Erzgebirge was named a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And it is here that the original Nutcrackers celebrated all over the world first came to be. It is quite possible that you have heard the most popular version of the Nutcracker before, originally titled The Nutcracker and the Mouse King, and written by the German Romantic author E.T.A. Hoffman way back in 1816. The French writer Alexandre Dumas later rewrote the famous story of Little Clara, the live nutcracker, and the sugar plum fairy in 1844. And this is the most popular version of the story, known to many a child in different countries around the world. In truth, it was less grim than the German version, and it went on to become a famous ballet. 
with beautiful, melodious music composed by none other than Tchaikovsky. It was to be the famous composer's last ballet. In Act One, we enjoy the opening scene of a festive family Christmas party in 19th century Nuremberg, Germany. Clara, or Marie in other versions, has a magician for a godfather, and that night he gifts her with a nutcracker doll. The Christmas tree somehow grows as tall as a house, the toy soldiers do battle, and the nutcracker takes on some mice for a jostle. He defeats the mice before being transformed into a human. Soon, Clara is whisked off to a winter wonderland where they dance the entire night away, and so do all the other festive toys. With Act Two comes more enchantment, delightful harp melodies, and synchronized strings. The music ascends and descends as the drama rises and falls with each aria. You can almost imagine dancing yourself down golden gilded stairs in a baroque palace with a sugar plum fairy and all those live toys. There is both powerful music and extraordinary tenderness all in one. It is a tale that transcends to another realm of magic, where myths, stories, and dreams really do come to life. By the middle of the 1900s, the magic of this enchanting children's story had traveled across the seas to reach the theaters of America. And there, too, it left boys and girls, mothers and fathers, aunts, uncles, and grandparents, all entranced. The ballet was staged for Christmas in 1944 by the San Francisco Ballet Company. Ever since then, theaters all around the world put on the fantastic show for families to enjoy. The story of toys and magic has enthralled many a child and naturally many a child at heart. But what does this have to do with the Ore Mountains of Saxony? Just about everything. In Eastern Germany, the nutcracker figures are a traditional Christmas decoration, as are the smoking men of Germany. Hand-carved and hand-painted wooden figurines that are placed on tables and shelves as incense burners. From outside on the snowy streets, if you were to take a winter walk in Saxony, you would wait until dusk when the sun sets and chilly winds blow. The streets might grow dim, but candle lights in home windows still shine the way to your destination. Peering into the windows, you see silhouetted figures of hand-carved wooden arches or candle holders. The people here have been lighting them for centuries. You see, this region is only known for its mining industry. Back in the day, when tired fathers, brothers, uncles, and nephews would start the long trek home from the mines, the candlelights from the houses would guide them. And the sight of slight decorations and candles in the homes would cheer the hearts of the men, just as they warm the hearts of passers-by today. 
Winters are especially dark and cold in Europe, and Germany is no exception. Often, the snowstorms bring in blankets of snow, piled meters high, and blocking the entrances to homes. Or, after an extremely heavy downfall, cutting off entire villages. So, you can just imagine how it must have been for the families of miners as they awaited their boys, their fathers, and perhaps even grandfathers, lighting candles and hoping and praying that all would come home safely. With the days so short, and the nights so long. The chilling winter wind too cold. There was warmth found in the simple thought of home. It must have been quite dark as the men trudged home in high snow. A silence so deep it could have felt also bleak. Their boots and mittens might not have been enough to keep out frostbite. And true, the times were hard in those days. So when they saw a flicker of candlelight, or the smoke rising from chimneys, it would have given them a little courage and hope that home was not so far away. Imagine, if you will, that you are the one coming home, that you have finally finished the long day's work, and you can't wait to be back with your family again. Your steps are slower, heavier in the thick, thick snow, your pile of mining tools heftier with each step forward. Yet the winter sky is beautiful. For the darker the night, the brighter the stars above shine. The colder the temperatures, the warmer the thought of home, and a hot bowl of stew waiting for you feels. You might hear the sound of hoofs as a horse-drawn wagon passes clopping by. And as you stop to look inside the windows, you would notice that each of the nutcrackers are carved in the forms of soldiers, horseback riders, or kings. They look on sternly, with large, painted white teeth, their tall helmets, and the stiffly buttoned-up uniforms worn by the law enforcement officers of the olden days. And this explains why their disposition is so serious. Another popular winter symbol throughout the Ore Mountains are those candle arches in the windows. On a crisp winter night like this one, they create a warmer ambience. Indeed, back in the day, candlelight was used long before electricity lit the homes and gave the village residents the security they craved. The first candle arches were probably designed as festive lighting, made, sold, and used on important festivals and holidays, shaped like the hills, and symbolizing the entrance to an ore mine. And as you trudge on towards home, those arched candles point the way. You know that inside kitchens, a pot of salted potatoes might be bubbling. A dense loaf of bread, perhaps just sliced. A wife, a child or two, a family might await you. And if you had no one back home, well, there were always friends ready to share stories around a mug of mulled wine. You can smell the scent already, Christmas spices to make the cold, long nights more bearable, and whatever your preferred drink of choice, for you know, it could be a tall glass of malt beer, or a pint of grog, 
rum with fresh lemons and a splash of honey. The hearth and home would be waiting for you when you reached your journey's end. It was Friedrich Wilhelm Fuchtner, the ore mountain carver, who first carved the Nutcracker model in 1870. During World War II, the Steinbach Wood Carving Company relocated to Hanover, where many American soldiers were stationed. When the soldiers returned home, they, of course, brought back many souvenirs from Germany to their families and children, and the Nutcracker character made its trip to the world, fascinating children and adults ever since. During Christmas, Germans in this region would bake a very special kind of bread using candied fruits and sweets and almonds. This cake is known as Stollen, and it is also representative of the cradled, swaddled baby Jesus. And of course, it was the wooden nutcrackers that were used to split open the nuts for the cake. Stollen, if you have not yet tasted it before, could be comparable to what other countries know as fruitcake. But the German version is more dense, moist when eaten at the right temperature, stuffed with nuts and candied fruits, and dusted with a snowy white icing to complete this rich and delicious cake. What else might be awaiting you when you reach your home after a long walk through the winter snow. Perhaps a roasted goose, cooked to perfection. The crispy skin doused with a rich brown sauce and a pile of red cabbage on your plate. It would be eaten with potato or bread dumplings. Roasted duck or goose delicacies are also traditional holiday meals in other parts of the world. And although each country and culture have their own version of the dish, these birds, when cooked just right, deliver some of the most unforgettable flavor. Its rich meat can be boiled, fried, or baked until just falling off the bone, tender, juicy, succulent. Serve roasted goose on the bone with roasted potatoes, or take more time to prepare traditional bread dumplings seasoned with bits of bacon, as a proper German grandmother might have done. Perfectly delicious. To learn about the full history of the Saxon nutcrackers, travelers to Germany can pay a visit to the Nutcracker Museum in Neuhausen. This building was also the first Nutcracker Museum in Europe, and just as you might expect, they have on display the largest Nutcracker collection in the world. Or you can choose to come during the annual Nutcracker Collectors' Convention to enjoy the colorful figurines. But even if you don't travel in person to visit the Saxon Nutcrackers, it is still possible to imagine tonight the feeling of warmth and festivity that they bring to homes and families all over Germany and other parts of Europe. And imagine, too, the wind's lullaby as it sails in the air on a cold winter's day when snowflakes fall and blanket the earth. It seems as if the world is unbelievably quiet. It feels as if a lovely spell has fallen. That winter magic. All around your ears, your body, your entire being, snow brings a sense of grace and peace. It is easier to block out the cares of the world when you are fully present in mind and heart, when you can cancel out all other distractions and simply 
enjoy the present moment. Imagine tonight that fantastic tales and dreams can be cherished, can be yours. If you are lucky enough to have a loved one to share the warmth with, then take the time now to be grateful for them. Cherish the thought of home and family as you sink into your pillow, imagining the changing of time and seasons, the hope of a new day tomorrow. It is now completely dark outside, but twinkling stars shine down on all the nutcrackers in Saxony. They become the winter lamps against a backdrop of nothingness. They light the way for travelers everywhere, and they will guide you home. I hope you enjoyed this trip to Germany. I wish you sweet dreams and a good night's sleep. Thank you for joining me. I'll be with you again tomorrow on Soothing Pod. Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pod. Tonight, I will be your guide as we learn about the way of tea. In a world that's always competing for our attention, what would happen if we learned to focus and concentrate on one thing only? This is what we will explore today. Centuries ago, the Japanese people made the way of tea a way of life, and since then, it has reached all corners of the earth. So today, we are going to learn a thing or two about the fascinating culture and tradition. To get comfortable, you will need to remove your shoes, place them to the side, and as you do so, Lay aside any thoughts of the day that are bothering you. Get really quiet, because no talking is allowed during the tea ceremony. Slip into an attire that is relaxing, and try to pause for a few seconds of silence. One, two, three, four, five. Let your breathing become relaxed and easy. Let's think about all that we are going to see, learn, and enjoy in this next half hour. Are you ready? And now, a sliding door to a small room opens. You approach, barefoot. The opening of this tea room is low, and so you must bend a little as you enter. On the floor in this small room are a variety of tatami mats, traditionally used in Japanese interiors. There isn't any other furniture in this room. The tones are earthy, and the silence is calming. A single orchid stands beautifully in the corner, across from an iron pot, and a few utensils and bowls. A woman appears, on both knees. She is graceful, silent. She moves across the tatami mat without saying a word. A kimono wraps her slender body. It is purple in color. A plain brown sash around her waist contrasts those darker hues of her traditional ensemble. Her hands dance over a red cloth, and she folds it over her fingers, measuring a smaller fold each time. This is the Fukusa, a special square cloth made out of silk. At this point of time, the beginning of the tea ritual, she is symbolically purifying the utensils which will be used one by one. 
With this red cloth, she purifies by slowly wiping the tea bowls and bamboo tea ladle. Yes, you realize, these are more like bowls than cups. And indeed, Japanese folks use bowls rather than cups or mugs during the tea ceremony. In very traditional rituals, the bowls used can be over 400 years old. Each movement of the woman has been premeditated, and even now, as she silently glides her fingers over the ladle and then the bamboo whisk, she is thoughtful, tender, Next, she inspects a small bowl, cupping it in one hand, while wiping it clean with the other. Her focus is sharp. Her gaze never leaves wherever her hands may roam. You continue to watch, mesmerized. It is often said that the way of tea cannot be taught in any book and it is clear that she has performed this ritual many times before. As if paying respects even to the whisk, she inspects it before stirring it lovingly. Harmony, respect, purity, tranquility. These are the four Zen principles which make up the way of tea. Now, she carefully scoops out two ladlefuls of green matcha, placing the powder in the center of the bowl, letting it glide into the bowls, and then tapping the ladle on the side of the bowl afterward, so as not to waste a single dust. As you observe her, you wonder at her movement for they are almost like a choreographed dance. You imagine trying to learn or comprehend this dance, and you wish to someday perform the ritual yourself. But the truth is a little less complex than your mind makes it out to be. For the truth is that the tea ceremony does not ask you to remember anything. It simply asks you to be present, be here, in this moment, to be a silent witness to the beauty that is caring, good company, and a warm imbibing of liquid that cleanses your body and soul. The iron pot in the corner of the room has been holding steaming water all this time. And now, the woman turns aside to lift its lid and extract some water with her long, long ladle handle. The tea bowl is on the floor, and the ladle travels from the pot to the tea as the steaming water is poured over the green matcha powder melting it with a gentle splash. The Japanese tea ceremony was a social art form that combined skill, art, and performance. Historically, it was around the 8th century that Japan was introduced to tea from neighboring China. At first, it was drunk for its health and medicinal properties, benefiting mostly the upper class of society and priests. Monks would use it during their meditational practices, so it became a daily ritual, and synonymous with centering oneself to find peace. When the water has filled the cup halfway, she now produces the clean whisk and stirs the liquid until it becomes frothy. You realize, with a smile, that this whisking noise is the first sound that the woman has made since entering. Swish, 
swish, swish. She whisks and mixes the matcha. Matcha is also called green tea and is a type of leaf extract known for its many health benefits. You ponder all the power contained in this tiny bowl and marvel at the ways man has modernized the planet, only to return to the simplest of rituals for health of body, mind, and spirit. It is said that matcha tea is packed with antioxidants and is an effective detoxifier. It naturally calms the mind, relaxes the body, enhances a human being's good mood, and even aids in concentration. Other benefits from green tea are its ability to lower the body's blood sugar, cholesterol, and heighten its ability to ward off diseases. Modern science has shown that centuries of tradition may hold more truth than we realize. The L-theanine, a rare amino acid, does aid the body's relaxation and a sort of relaxed alertness in the brain. You notice, as she motions for you to take a sip, that you are now in tune with your flow. Seeing her handle all of the utensils and make the tea slowly, yet assuredly, has set you on the path of peace. The woman points to the bowl, and you understand that she wants you to take a moment to admire it. You turn it slightly to gaze at the intricate, hand-drawn paintings that decorate its sides. Tiny flower petals, a bird, a flick of silvery paint. She then hands you her bowl to admire. In contrast to yours, hers is dark and undecorated. Its mold and shape feel almost as if it fits snugly into your hands, and you can imagine the potter work with the clay even before it was hardened in a raging kiln. This is the essence of a Japanese tea bowl. And now, in this moment, you come to understand that, in the world and way of tea, the humble bowl serves more than a single purpose. The aesthetics of its monochrome brown tones also portray an earthy, rustic simplicity. There is a stillness and depth in this seemingly ordinary bowl, and the artist who fashioned it most likely had it in mind to convey this beautiful depth to the person who would be lucky enough to one day hold it in the palm of their hands. And after you observe the bowl, you lower your head to take a sip. Even before your lips touch the bowl's rim, the fragrance of the matcha tea and the soft warmth enveloping your hands are calming. You sip it now, slowly letting the liquid touch your lips, run down your throat, soothe your tired body, and give you renewal. One sip, two sips, three sips. The woman guides you, and you follow her lead. You flow in tune to the silent music she makes, the visible dance, the way of tea. After drinking, you bow in respect and gratitude to each other. If you happen to be more than just one person for company, you will traditionally take a sip from the bowl, admire it and your host who has blessed you with the tea, then pass the bowl on for another person to sip. As you sip and pass, sip and pass, sip and pass, 
you all take a moment to be grateful for your companions, for your friends, for your teachers and guides. You say a silent prayer of gratitude for all that has passed before this moment and everything that you now feel in it. In Japan, those who attend a tea ceremony accept the fact that there will never be another one exactly like this one in this lifetime. It is a ritual that may be done over and over again, but never in the same space of time, never in the exact same fashion. When you have finished drinking, your host again produces the red silken cloth. The final part in the tea ceremony is an after-cleansing of the utensils. So again, she wipes the tea scoop or ladle, the whisk, and finally, the tea bowl. An important concept in the Japanese tea ceremony is wabi and sabi. Wabi is the quiet refinement and soberness of spirit. Sabi represents everything material in your life that ages and decays with time. Balancing the two is important for success and strength in life. After the tea ceremony is over, and you have exchanged vows. You want to wander through the garden a little, and today, there is still time. And so, you do. Taking your leave quietly, treading ever so silently, and replacing your shoes on your feet as you step outside in the cool afternoon air, a calm breeze lifts your heart, just like the tea lifted your sluggish body. You stroll through the garden, meandering down a flower lane, lingering over a bush where butterflies are dancing, and noticing the stone lantern placed a little to the far end of the garden. In fact, there are many stones in this garden of varying sizes and shapes. There is also a pond with gorgeous koi fish. They swish their tails as if dancing, and you reach down to make ripples in the water with your fingertips. As you do so, you see your own reflection in the water, and a golden ray of sunlight illuminating your contours. The tea ceremony took less than an hour, yet it seemed like more. I hope you enjoyed this little ritual, and that it gave you some calm and soothed your mind. Now, as you continue your journey to a restful sleep, take that calm within you and let it linger. You may now continue walking through the garden or simply sit, or even lie down in the soft green grass. Close your eyes, and imagine that there is no other place you would rather be. The soft wind's sweet caress, the nourishment from the tea, the moonlight on your face, and now, dream sweet. Good night. I'll be with you again tomorrow, here on Soothing Pod.